It's a beautiful day today. A bit cloudy though because it has been raining I think early this morning or last night. I'm not really sure. You might notice a few differences today. The first of which is that I'm wearing short pants and the second would be multiple camera angles. And if you're wondering how I managed to achieve that, let me show you. Just turning on the camera. That's right, two cameras. Anyway, before we get too distracted, this episode is going to pick up from where we last left off. And that's where I was harvesting pops. And you'll notice that in the course of doing that, I had to trim some of the flower stalks. And in this episode, we're going to discuss the things that we could do to flower stalks. So let's begin. <laughs> now, before we begin, let's first put things into context. I live in the Southern Hemisphere. I'm from Melbourne, Australia which means that our seasons run in reverse from the Northern Hemisphere. So as the lot of you who's watching from the Northern Hemisphere, especially those at the higher latitudes, you're heading to winter now. We down here in Australia are heading into summer. We're pretty close to the end of November and December is the official start of summer. Now let's talk a bit about flower stalks. There's a few of them here as you can see behind me. There's this blue butterfly, there's some sedum right here more echeverias, they're starting to push out flower stalks. And I think one of the first things that you have to keep in mind is when do the flower stalks form. If you live in a climate where the four seasons are distinct, then you will notice that they would flower at least twice a year. And it's almost at the same time every year. So the first point of discussion is when do flowers form? The answer to that is very simple. There's a few factors involved. But the main thing is, of course, number one, it has to be mature enough because really young plants are more focused on their own growth rather than pushing out flower stalks. And you'll find that mature plants or more established plants are more likely to push out stalks. So the first item is maturity. The second item is dormancy. Flowering plants require a period of dormancy before they push out flowers. And as you know, a lot of plants go dormant during winter. It's particularly obvious for those that shed their leaves in autumn or fall. And by the time spring arrives, that's after winter, they will be producing lots of flower buds and flowers. And that's hay fever season. <laughs> I'm always a victim of that. But in case you didn't know, succulents also go dormant in summer even the summer growers because when it is too hot what they do is they try to protect themselves from the heat of the sun and they go into a pseudo dormancy state you'll definitely notice this with echeverias because in spring they would be opening wide even raising their leaves up and i find that a raised leaf form allows them to gather more water you know spreading your wings a cup this way allows you to catch lots more of the rainwater or any water source from above but as it gets closer to summer it closes up this way and with their leaves curled tight like this as if hiding from the sun no! and during that point they would be reducing their metabolism or something like that they would not be expending as much energy trying to grow because the weather is harsh and because of that you will find that sometime during autumn or fall some flower buds would come out again and this is usually something that happens after dormancy. So we have two dormancy cycles throughout the year and two flowering cycles throughout the year. That's if you have the four distinct seasons. Now if you live somewhere in the tropics where it doesn't get too cold and the weather, the climate is only warm or hot, then you only have the pseudo dormancy in summer. Of course you have the summer dormant plants like aeoniums, but for summer growers or plants that grow during the warmer months, their only hope for getting dormancy is during the heat of summer. And I find that for echeverias, they tend to go dormant as soon as the temperature goes over 35 degrees. That's about 90s or 100 Fahrenheit, somewhere in that range. And if it's the first time for your plants reaching that temperatures, you might want to protect them, you know, put a bit of shade. I'll be showing you that in future episodes. Having said that, those are the two main triggers for blooming with succulents. That was the first point of discussion. Now the next part is, what do we do with them? Seeing that this video is still part of my propagation series of videos, then of course the first thing that you can do 
is to use them for propagation. In terms of propagating with flower stalks, there's a few things you can do. One of the things that you could do is just to remove the flowers from the flower stalk. In this case, I'm going to chop off just this part and leave the rest of the stalk alone. It's best if you could leave a lot of the leaves intact in the stem because if you look at the nodes where the leaves are connected, this is where potentially where the new pops would be growing out of. So you would want to have as many nodes as you can left on the stem. So if you remove the flowers on the tip of this stem, to probably keep trying to produce flowers along the lower nodes. So just keep removing them until eventually it just gives up and produces a pop rather than trying to produce flowers. And if you think it looks familiar, it is, because it basically is the same principle as beheading your plant. Only this is the head and this is the stump. The pups will grow all around the stump where the leaf nodes are connected. The second method is where you take the entire stalk as is. Basically, you're going to chop it off the whole thing and you will want to replant it and let it grow its own roots. And what would happen here is that the replanted stalk would think it is a new plant it would figure out that there are no plantlets, it is going terminal since it's just a flower stalk, knows it's gonna die, and in order to save itself or self-preservation kicks in, it's going to produce new plants, new pops along the stem, along the leaf nodes. That way it can continue on, perpetuate its species. That way by the time this stalk dies, it has a new plant and it lives on through those pops. Then finally, there's a third method. The third method is actually a mix between the first two. Like the first method, you're going to remove all of the flowers. And like the second method, you're going to remove the stem, detach it from the parent plant, and let it grow its own roots. There are of course advantages and disadvantages to each technique. And let's go through them one by one. So with the first method, that is just chopping off the flowers. This is going to be the easiest and the least risky among the bunch, I guess. Because what you have is a stem that's still connected to the main plant which means that the main plant is feeding the stem ergo there is not going to be any gap in the growth of this stem and by that I mean that it would continue growing there's no interruptions and among the three methods this is the fastest way to grow pups if you're lucky for it to grow pups and I say if you're lucky because right now the stem the flower stalk it thinks it is still a flower stalk the plant thinks it's a flower stalk so it's still more likely that whatever pushes out of the leaf nodes are new flowers so with this method you get better growth but the trade-off is less likelihood of getting pups you're still more likely to get flowers unless there's an anomaly or a, an accident happy accident going on here so that's pretty much it for the first method for the second method you're going to chop off the entire stalk so imagine this being detached and planted on its own it will grow its own roots and on its own the flower stalk will think that it is its own plant its own system and it will figure out that there's no plant no plantlet no pop and as you know flower stalks are terminal which means that after the flowers finish blooming the whole stalk will dry out and eventually die it takes months but it will happen so before that happens, it has to go into self-preservation mode and to that end, what it would try to do is to push out pups along the leaf nodes just to continue, just to perpetuate its own species, so to speak. So to ensure the survival of its species, it's going to produce pups or children and it will live on through its children. That's the second method. Of course, disadvantages. There's a period of interruption with the growth as you chop off the stem and allow it to reroot. That in itself takes a bit of time, usually a few weeks, several weeks, maybe even a month. And during that time, it would focus all of its energy into growing roots. So until that happens, you're not going to expect anything else to happen here. And that's pretty much it. Now the third method, as I've said, is a hybrid, a mix between the first two methods. That is, from the first method, we're going to remove the flowers from the stalk. And from the second method, we're going to remove the stem flower stock from the main plant and that's what I would like to think a very good compromise for the first two so what happens is it is replanted of course which means that there's a better likelihood of the leaf nodes pushing out pops rather than flowers compared to the first method by removing the flowers at the tip this means that it's going to focus all of the growth on the lateral meristems as far as the flower stock is concerned this is the head the flowers the flowering tip and if you remove the apical meristem this is the apical meristem right here if you remove that, it will activate all of the lateral meristems, so everything here would be growing. All of the growth would be focused on these nodes. So in effect, this is still slower than the first method, but a lot faster than the second method. And this is what I would recommend you doing. And much like my recent video on leaf propagation using flower stalks, 
I'd recommend that you pick out flower stalks that are thick with larger leaves as opposed to very thin flower stalks because those would dry out easily. And that's another thing that you have to take note of when attempting something like this. So far, I only mentioned one of the things that you could do with flower stalks and that's propagation. And now we're going to discuss the second thing and that's removing all of the flower stalks to prevent insect infestation. So if you're wondering why I had to lead this video saying that I live in the southern hemisphere and we're going to summer, well, summer is where a lot of the insects come out and play. I'm pretty sure you've noticed that with your own plants. And like they say, prevention is a lot better than cure. So before we head deep into summer, it's a good idea to remove all of the flower stalks that I'm not going to use. As you recall, there's a few plants that I used in a pollination video a few weeks back. But for the rest of them, like this one, it's off with their stalks. Apart from the health reasons of avoiding pests, another reason is a matter of aesthetics. And I think that arguably, Echeverias look better without flower stalks. It's just messy. I guess it's an acquired taste because once you've seen the flower stalks enough, you would start thinking they're messy. So I'm the type of person who sits at the camp of no flower stalks. And I firmly believe that the rosettes look good on their own. They don't need flowers, except maybe to identify them. So what I usually do is to take photos of the flowers keep them in my archives, just label them, just so I can confirm what species they are. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So, buy flower stalks. This Echeveria Big Red has a flower stalk that's already blooming. And I think I can use this for method two, where I just remove the entire stem. So let's go do that. I tried going as slow as possible, keeping all of the leaves. That way, there's more nodes to work with. I'm going to give this a couple of days to callus over, and then I'll plant this in soil. I've got another big red here. It has this flower stalk, and as you can see, the tip has lots of aphids. So I'm going to remove the flowers. And because of that, I think this is a perfect example of the third method of propagation, where I detach the whole flower stalk and remove the flower tips. I've also got this Echeveria Double Delight. It is pushing out a flower stalk. It's getting quite tall now. The tips has some flower buds. It hasn't bloomed yet. I think this would be a very good candidate for the first method. So, chop off the tip here. And I'm going to leave the stalk as is. I'm tempted to pull out the leaves, but I can't be bothered right now. Yeah, let's leave it at that. And one final thing, one more reason why you would want to remove flower stalks is because large flower stalks can distort the shape of the rosette. So as soon as I see that the flower stalk is pushing hard against the leaves, I try to remove it. And this tends to happen with larger cultivars like anything that's based on Gibiflora. So all of the freely hybrids that you see here, these are the ones most prone to that problem. 
And that's it for this episode on what to do with the flower stalks. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did this video. Make sure to like and subscribe if you want to watch more of this type of content. And I'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Special thanks to my Patreon supporters such as Oscarino, Julie Seal, Snap Kui, Lorena Noti, Camila Maez, Linda Leal, Gwen Ott, Jesse May, Q2, and everyone else who pledge on Patreon. Thank you so much. And finally, you can check out my Instagram that's at SeriesCapades and I post a photo of an Echeveria every single day under the hashtag DailyEcheveria.